Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is another episode of the Government Coins Podcast. We are on episode five. And over the last few seasons, it's been pretty crazy. Uh, But nevertheless, we're here. We're back with another amazing guest. Today, I'm here with Judy Brandt. She is the CEO of Summit Insight. And over the past 30 years, she's become an expert in not only federal government contracting, but knowing how to build relationships uh, that need to be that you need to succeed with federal buyers. So as a consultant, a speaker and an author, she's helped thousands of businesses, uh, small, mid tier and large businesses find their tracks in the federal space. So her clients use proprietary players, layers, uh, methodologies players and layers methodologies to get in front of the right federal buyers and win over $200 million. Did y'all hear that? $200 million in federal business. Like that is insane. That is insane. Uh, But you can pick up her latest book, which is the number one best-selling government contracts made easier. Uh, This is the second edition and it's also on Amazon. Um, And that'll come along with a workbook. So not only will you have something to read, follow along with, you're actually doing the work, implementing this stuff at the same time. So I love that. And so right now, let's learn a little bit more about how to make easier happen for you. So please welcome Judy. Judy, how are you? Hey, I am excited. Excited to be with you and your community. And I want to encourage folks, if you've got questions, pop them onto the YouTube live, uh, interrupt us, make this a fun session, whatever yeah. your problem or your challenge is. I don't know everything, but odds are good that I probably know somebody who does if it's not something I can tackle or you can tackle. Absolutely. Live. So this is going to be an amazing, um, amazing episode because Again, Judy has the experience in this space, and we're here to have a conversation around different opportunities and just how to make it easier, Uh, but also that conversation around, I can't find opportunities for my business, which we hear often where people usually will pop up, and so you already have people in the chat saying hi and hello, so definitely excited about that, Uh, but definitely want to hop in. Judy, is there anything else you would like to share with the audience about yourself and your experience in this space? Well, you know, uh, I'm a lifelong learner. I love to learn, but I get most excited about learning something from somebody who's not only seems to have the right stuff, but somebody who doesn't seem like they were born to have this thing be real easy for them. I think we're in a culture that I think glorifies pinnacle achievement and dismisses or ignores the long slog. There's no such thing as overnight success, even among people who appear to be at the top of their game. They work very, very hard to be there. But I get real excited about learning from somebody who was never natural at the thing, who had to struggle. And the part of federal business that Summit Insight, my company and my whole team specializes in is all about the, really it's the home of human connection in the federal arena. And that is all around transforming people's understanding of what sales actually is. And I will tell you that I spent the first 25 years of my career so uninterested, so deeply uninterested (laughs) in sales that I literally left the country. Um, Mm -hmm. I had been working for IBM Canada and I wanted to do strategy. And they said, great, you're going to do strategy. And it took me six months to realize that I was working for the planet's largest sales organization. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't get out fast enough. Over the next 25 years, I did a lot of work in consulting. It was that escape from sales that led me into being a consultant on government contracting for the Canadian government for the first 15 years of my career. And then launching my company coming up on 20 years ago in 2003. But in 2014, I had to come face to face with something I had avoided for a quarter of a century. I ended up spending a story for another day, a full Mm -hmm. year in the trenches doing the S word sales for seven companies 
who are doing everything from snap lock food containers to city block size backup generators to waterless shampoo and my favorite root canal equipment. I was yeah. literally dialing for dollars for endodontics and wow, it was brutal. I just had one day to the next and I only had so much time to spend with each company, but I was on the hook for thousands of calls and hundreds of introductions. I had the good fortune to have decided this was the time to work with the amazing Eileen Kent, who has become my training partner in the programs I developed afterward. Cause I got to the end of that year. I made my thousands of calls and hundreds of introductions. I went, I am done. I am <laughs> never doing this again. Wait a second. I cannot be the only person who has subject matter expertise and who doesn't know how to do this thing. Nobody should spend a year. Nobody should spend a month doing, having the experience I just did. It's gotta be easier. And that really got me connected with my mission to help dedicated, determined subject matter experts in the federal arena get out of their own way and connect with the humans who are making buying decisions and who need what we do. But in order to make that difference for them, we have to step up and make the offer. Mm. And that's a good point. And, and, and I think just the overall marketing aspect of it, and I also share your sentiments with the sales aspect of it. Um, definitely, I'll immediately run for the door when we start talking about sales. <laughs> immediately. Um, but I guess understanding how that experience in, that, in the sales space transition uh, for you in the government space and how that, where they align, let's put it that way. So where are some of those areas you would see some similarities? Well, um, people misunderstand what sales is. Mm. Sales, and this is in part because there, um, the biggest misunderstanding about government contracting is that there's any such thing as selling to the government. And I want to bust this myth right here. So write this down. It's important. There's no such thing as selling to the government. Mm. There's only doing business as people and with people. Mm. Because when you win a federal contract, there's another human being who signs that document and they are putting everything, their mission, their career, their future on the line when they choose us. Mm. Very nice. And most people forget that. And so understand that it's, it's literally personal. It's not some kind of a process. Nobody's doing business with a process. And so in order for that person, and it turns out there's a cast of people who need to regard us as the low risk choice before making that contract award. When you break it down and realize you're doing business with people and each one of them needs and wants different things, depending on their responsibilities mm. and the roles they play in their agency. That means that in order to be successful, really realize, oh, nuts, I got to really slow down. <laughs> I've got to really not be a mile wide and an inch deep, but pick a few places, mm -hmm. go slow, go yeah. deep. Be patient because you're going to do it sooner or later. You're going to spend time and you're going to spend money. All you get to choose is the mix. Mm, very nice. Very nice. Go slow, go deep. I know we have definitely had that conversation multiple times. Um, definitely narrowing down your area of expertise. Try not to do so much so fast. Like just relax, <laughs> get your toes wet. So definitely like that aspect of it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the marketing component. So someone was asking basically, how do you market or build relationships? One call at a time. And it comes back to the, your, the choices that you have for creating focus. There are four things that companies that are successful in the federal arena all do. And if you're listening to this, you're going to do these things, whether 
we never speak again, or we become BFFs. Mm -hmm. And these four things are first, beef up and buff up what I call your federal sales game. Mm -hmm. Understanding who the players are at all five layers, and what to do, what to say, and what to ask to build relationships with them. The second thing people do when they're successful is focus. Make a confident choice, ideally based on hard data of who buys what you do, how they buy, how much they buy, and who they're buying from now so that you can concentrate your efforts on a few places that you know need what you do. You know you can make a difference for them. And that will make it much easier to be resilient with the what can be a discouraging ongoing conversation when they say no and no and no right. and no until they say now. But it, it data shows that it takes anywhere from 15 to 30 touches, instances of engagement to get from contact to contract, 15 to 30. And so if you're thinking, yeah, I've called them twice, I've called them three times, what's wrong with these people? And then your brain makes up stories about why they're not calling when if you never talk to them, you can't tell in the first place. And so the only way, and this happens to me in my company too, <laughs> uh, it takes, people talk about GovCon as a relationship game. That's right. And I say, yes, and it's also a team sport. Mm -hmm. By which I don't mean teaming with large companies or even teaming with small ones or midsize, although that's important. I mean, the team within your company and the team of select subject matter experts that you put around you to buttress and support what you do, because nobody does everything. I don't write proposals, for example. You couldn't pay me enough money to write a federal <laughs> proposal. It's not because they're not important. They are and they can be. I'm not any good at it. <laughs> but I have great referral partners for, uh, for things like that. So the first thing, understand this federal sales game, beef it up, buff it up. The second thing, focus, make a confident choice, ideally based on hard data. The third piece is have a structured federal sales plan built around your chosen agencies. So that the average contact relationship management system, whether yours is a spreadsheet, a pile of business cards, or a big fancy schmancy thing that costs you way too much money and time to run, they show you who you know, right? A great federal sales plan shows you who you don't know, but the data says you need to know and gives you a methodical, systematic way to knit together those relationships so people who know you and love you and trust you are opening doors to other people that also need you. Because here's the thing, the federal buyers who people who already know us and love us, even our best corporate or commercial clients do not wake up in the morning going, how can I dump a bucket of cash on Sheila's head? <laughs> now they should, but they don't. They can be trained to do this though, because they want us to thrive but we're not thinking about it. So we have to kind of get out of being uncomfortable and ask for the referral, ask for the introduction, write this down. This is another write this down moment. All right, here's how you do that without feeling awkward or like you're begging, okay? Mm, that's My business, a good here we go. My business is growing and we're looking for new projects. Practice it till it feels comfy. My business is growing and we're looking for new projects. If you were me, who would you be talking to? My business is growing and for looking for new projects. Who do you know who would love to have this superlative experience and result that I've created for you? And if this person is your A-list person, they're going to say, oh yeah, let me introduce you. If they don't respond quite that way, say, yeah, I think you should talk to so-and-so. You can say, would you introduce us? Or could I use your name and say you sent me? And that get used to doing that because someone who has already done business with you is 12 times more likely to buy something else from you than someone who's never heard of you. 
Put another way, if you're not already routinely following up with the people that you've already worked with, you're working 1200% harder than you need to. So step one, federal sales claim. Step two, focus. Step three, sales plan. The fourth step, use the plan. How hard is that? That takes commitment and practice and muscle. And research shows that when people are accountable to each other, people make a commitment in a small group to do things together, even if it's within the same company, you are five times more likely to implement a change than doing things alone. So having account mutual accountability for doing things differently is also a big deal. So those four pieces, that's the journey we take our clients on. And some of them within eight weeks or less, they create and launch a custom federal sales plan and have a solid relationship pipeline right. into at least three places where they're confident they can win work. Wow. So I think that's a, such a great segue into the next component of I'd never see companies or opportunities for companies like mine. Um, we've had a few businesses, well, businesses ask all the time. Actually, we just got a, we got a question about it uh, as well, but I'll, I'll ask about it. And it says, basically, I have an insurance agency and I'm trying to get into government contracting space. I can't find any opportunities uh, for my company. Do you think there are opportunities in my industry? So those type of conversations, how do you usually navigate those? The basic principle, there are two, two stages. The first, flip the lens. Flip the lens. The 80% of the companies that I talk to who are in GovCon are asking the wrong question. Instead of asking, what can I bid? Flip it over and say, who's my buyer? Who's my buyer? And how can I get in front of them before everybody else? Nice. Now, there is, in order to make the decision, it's a really important decision. And I encourage everyone who's listening and watching in government contracting, be in or be out. Don't dangle your toes from the water and kind of dip a toe. Just no, it is, it's going to siphon off your time and your attention and your money. And for all of us, whether it's two folks in the garage or Northrop Grumman, we've got limited time and resources. And so in, in, in order to make that choice of where to focus, where to get to know our buyers, there's a qualitative or there's a quantitative approach. And these, and you can find the details on how to do both in my book, Government Contracts Made Easier, which I tell you not because I, 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 I want to sell books, but because if I can't be at your elbow, then it's the next best thing. And now that we've met online, mm -hmm. when you read it, you'll be able to hear my voice just as though I were talking with you. So the quantitative approach, and um, you'll want to uh, drop this in the, uh, in the chat, is usaspending.gov. There's about four different sources for getting free, a boatload of free online data. Um, the prettiest source, um, and not necessarily my first choice, is usaspending.gov. And uh, you'll want to go into the part of the database that um, will let you, you'll just select contract awards, not grants and not a lot of other things. And you pick, say, the last three years of data, and you'll enter a few keywords that you know that people are always using to describe or talk about when they need what you do. And that's going to pop up a map and dollar figures all over it for, to give you some idea of where across these United States, federal buyers are buying or needing things like what you do. Okay. That's a starting point. And taking that analysis at a detailed level, and this is what we do when we work with our clients. And remember I said, you're going to spend time and you're going to spend money. All you get to choose is the mix. You can devote a couple of days of your time to learning through the online videos that the General Services Administration has created on SAM.gov contract data, not SAM.gov contract opportunities, but create a free account, log in and look at the educational videos on SAM.gov contract data 
ad hoc reports. This is going to let you extract past contract award data and get it out of there, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, pivot table it to a fair the well, and you'll really be able to see it, it when you pick the correct fields right down to the individual buying office. You'll start to get clues and often something as specific as email addresses, full or partial email addresses that will give you a clue to at least the first player at one of the five layers that you'll start to unpack like a detective to figure out who are the people in the individual buying office that's spending this kind of money on the thing that I do and they're doing business with those guys right now. Okay, so that's one broad brush approach. The alternative. I dropped all of the links in the chat. If you are listening to this, go to the YouTube channel. Judy is giving the links. I'm dropping them in the chat as we go. So definitely you follow. You are <laughs> fabulous. Thank you. The other approach is what I call a qualitative approach. And that is, I want you to think for a moment, if you're listening, here's, here's kind of the um, the easy, a different approach. Okay. If you're not really a numbers person, you're going, Oh, please spreadsheets. Oh no, no, just shoot me. <laughs> All right. Here we go. I want you to think right now about the size and type of project or, or order for your product or your service that you deliver. Now you could do, it's the, kind of the median order or project size. You could do a whole bunch of these all, the, all, all year long, do it profitably with your eyes closed and everybody's all real happy. So remember, it's not that big, huge project pie in the sky thing you'd love to win. It's not the penny ante stuff that you really don't like to do and you're not making any money on, but something in the middle, it's you enjoy it. It's meaty. People love doing it. You make money at it. Okay. So think about the characteristics of that project or that type of order. Now, next question. What problem does that project or product or service solve for the person who is your customer? So what's the median project or order in terms of size, scale, geography, dollar value, project length? Then what's the transformation or the result or the problem that you're solving for the person or the organization or the corporation that has engaged you? Third question, which federal offices, programs, agencies are most similar in size and scale and scope and geography to those things you do really well right now? So this is the mirror approach, okay? And I ask this because this is another important thing, write this one down. Federal buyers are some of the most risk averse life forms on earth. They want to know that you've solved their problem for someone who looks just like them yesterday afternoon. So the closer you can get to showing them a project or an order or a solution that is most similar to what they need, and you've done it recently in a at a scale that makes them go, oh yeah, yeah, you really can do the thing. And they can call your customer and go, hey, were that, was this really as real as they said? The more comfortable they're going to start to feel. Okay. So How does that sound? It sounds really good. And I think what the next person would say is basically what type of past performance can they leverage? Because a lot of great people question. I love that. And one of the webinars I'm giving later this year, I'm giving a series of six. And one of the next two I'm giving close to the end of the year is how corporate experience can open doors to federal opportunities. If your federal buyer knows you and likes you and wants to leave the door open for you, even if you've never done federal business before, your federal buyer gets to write the required and desirable prerequisites. And so they can say, for example, you know, must have done business with a federal agency in this region or a large company of a sim in a similar size and scale. If they know that you have corporate experience but have never done federal business before, if they don't know you, they can't change the specification to leave the door open for you. And so 
remember again, there's no such thing as doing business with the government. One office may say, oh, the government doesn't look at corporate experience. We only, the government only ta takes federal past performance. Well, the government is Susie at Navair. <laughs> okay. And so um, Chuck over at the Bureau of Personnel may be absolutely thrilled that you've, you've been doing business with um, Deloitte Human Resources. Okay. You never, you never know, but you haven't talked to Chuck at Bupers, so you don't know. Okay. And so if they get to know you and think that you're going to be their low risk choice, then you're helping them craft the opportunity to leave the door open for you. When you want to go and identify an agency that needs your services, time, precision, cost, pick any two. You can get an answer that's fast and cheap, but it'll be fuzzy. You can get fast and precise. It'll cost you. You can get cheap and precise, but it'll be slow. <laughs> okay. That's, that's it. But either way, once you choose, you want to choose no more than typically no more than two or three federal departments or agencies. And for example, Homeland Security is gigantic. So even within Homeland Security, you may choose, maybe you're going to choose Customs and Border Protection, and the data shows that um, Immigration Customs Enforcement and CBP, those are the two who most need what you do within Homeland Security. So you're not going to be bothering the Secret Service, and you're not going to be wandering over to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. You're going to pick your two components. Similarly, Health and Human Services, it's huge. So even within Food and Drug Administration or National Institutes of Health, there may be two or three institutes or services or agencies within there. And that's going to be really important because okay. every single office where you want to do business, you're going to have to dig in once you've made your choice and start to identify the players at all five layers. Do you think people want to know who they are? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Of course they want to <laughs> all right. This is another write them down. There's a details on all this on my website at growfedbiz.com, growfedbiz.com under resources. You'll find all kinds of videos and guides about our trademarked players and layers methodology. And so two pieces, players and layers, roles and goals. We like things that rhyme. Here's the players, the players. So write them down. Okay. Every place you want to be successful in the federal arena You've got to know at least one and often more than one person in each of the following roles. The first is the stakeholder. And this is in no particular order. The stakeholder might be, in this case, the stakeholder might be the cabinet secretary or the CIO or the, uh, uh, the base commander. They might be the person who is the big, exciting conference speaker, um, the one who's on the front page of the, of the internet when something goes wrong, the one who's going to get fired if stuff goes really wrong, uh, but they are not in the room when the vendor is chosen. They're not involved in that. They're setting the priorities. They're setting the direction, the importance that, uh, and responsible for the mission. Okay. So you have to know who they are, their priorities. You can read those priorities in the, in the federal agency's uh, strategic plan. Every single federal agency, and almost all of them are, are leasing new ones this year, has a strategic plan. It's available for free on the agency's website. If you haven't looked at it and you're thinking about doing business with that agency, you better believe your competition has downloaded that and gone through it with a fine tooth comb to figure out what are the agencies? How is that department organized? What are the special priorities? What are the special language they use to talk about their challenges? More often than not, when I sit down with a client and go through this, point them, in, point them to the parts of the strategic plan that just pop with, oh, wow, these are the people who are doing insurance adjustment. These are the people who are lowering risk. Wow, these are the guys who are overhauling the user experience with veterans affairs. And it's right there in the strategic plan. It's very exciting. So stakeholder, then they're kind of at the helm of the whole ship first. You have to know who they are. You're almost certainly not going to call on them or, and you're not going to pitch to them at a conference ever. If you know their people and only if you know their people, you say, oh, you know, we were, we were talking to Shakia and she is incredible. You are so lucky to have her working in your part of the Food and Drug Administration. She is awesome and her team is fabulous. You're not going to 
say that if you don't know her, but tell, ask them how they're doing, ask them how their families are, mm -hmm. tell them you appreciate them, let them know their team members are great, but you're not going to ask them to go, you're not going to try to sell them anything. And you're not going to ask them to introduce you to somebody who needs what you do. So stakeholder. Second, contracting. The contracting office, contracting officer has a power the president of the United States does not have. That's the legal power to bind your company to these United States to deliver product or service under specific terms and conditions. Contracting officer who has that power is works with a, one or more contracting specialists who assist them, but don't have that power. Contracting layer. Contracting officer is not the one that's stuck with the consequences of working with you. They're not going to be at the receiving deck, uh, the receiving dock, picking up your box of stuff or working with you every day in the trenches. They're going to be running the competition, helping working with the end user layer. Now that mm -hmm. gets juicy. That, and what I call the end user layer, you're going to have multiple friends, multiple people you get to know at the end user layer. And that can include program manager. It can include supervisor. It can include engineering. It can include the people who are leading the teams, who are setting the priorities, who are in, it, maybe it's the warrior in the battle space, the person on the first, second, and third tier, or the help desk, the people who are stuck with the consequences of choosing you, whose people are working with yours every day. Okay. That's the third end user layer. These folks have lots to say about what they do and they don't want from the contractors they work with. Those are the folks that you need to be having conversations with many months before a requirement hits the street. You cannot go barging around in the end user shop with less than 30 days to go. Nobody's going to talk to you then. Okay. So end user layer, you're going to have multiple friends there. That's going to take, but the successful folks have lots of of friends there who will talk about their current clients. They'll talk about their situation, but they're not going to do it in a hurry. And they're not going to do it if they don't know you. So stakeholder, contracting, end user. Next layer, small business specialist. The small business specialist is not your buyer. They can't sign contracts. They are easy to find. They are often will have lots of things to talk to you about, and they're not your buyer. So if you look at all the business cards you have, and you have lots of supplier diversity officers and small business specialists and offices of small and disadvantaged, that's nice but you're missing the other four layers. And ironically, the more work you do, the more help they're going to be. 80% of the conversations that the small business specialists have start with, hi, I'm a service disabled veteran on 8A woman owned business in a hub zone. What do y'all do? It's awful. You're completely transfix them and say, Hi, we've been, we've taken a look at your strategic plan and your forecast. We understand you're doing business with these five primes. Your forecast suggests that the four projects coming up are ones we can help with. Our past performance suggests that we would perform well on this. And the uh, we see that you have these six other projects that are coming up within the next 18 months for renewal. These are the people that we've researched that we understand we might need to talk to. If you were us, where would you start? their eyes will bug out because nobody ever says that to them. And they will open the big file with the big drawer and say, oh, you don't want to talk to these guys. This one is left. These two people, they really need you. I'd love to make an introduction because you've read all their stuff. Absolutely. You're ready. All right. And layer number five, that is industry. Could be the incumbent prime. They might be large. They might be small. The data shows you Who's in there? How did they win? What type of contract are they on? And you can start to figure out, and again, by talking to end users particularly, do they love the incumbent or they can hardly wait for this contract to be over and they're not planning on picking up the option, option year. So you can start to figure out, are you going to have to nibble an opportunity off the back end? Or are you going to have to go down the altar with them and uh, go and do a partner, formal partnership to go play nice next time? So those are your players at five layers. That's nice. I like the breakdown and showing how each one has a different role in this space and also giving a better understanding in terms of who you're serving. Um, because a lot of times we do see a bunch of emails going out to the contracting officers, pitching, um, things like that. So that's another conversation, pitching your business um, to contracting officers. 
Have you experienced this a lot or heard of this a lot? Your contracting officer wants to know that you have past performance and experience and capability that's going to make you the low risk choice. They do care about your pricing. They also care about your financing and whether you can stay in business and do you have the capacity to perform on the project that you would just love to win. I'm going to now bring out my most powerful government contract consulting tool. Are you ready? I'm now for the next minute going to be the federal contracts fairy. I'm going to award you the contract of your dreams if, because fairy tales always have an if, they have a catch. If you have the stuff, the staff, the space, the servers to do it right now. Whoops. Not, oh, we're going to win it and then we're going to hire my brother-in-law and get lots of staffing and we'll hire some desk. We know exactly, no, sorry, now. Okay, which is why I talked about that, that median contract as a first one. Okay, really super important. And so you were, you were asking about the, uh, the, the way that... Pitching. To, so the, the, the kind of conversation you have with contracting, you go in slow it, on my website. You can also listen to, there's a, um, there's an, uh, a role play between one of our top gun coaches, William Randolph and my training partner, Eileen Kent. And so you can find the link on my website to conversation with a contracting officer. If you do role play, if you, if you type the word role play on my website in the search bar, it should get you to a place you can listen. Eileen does the setup because um, this was part of a, um, a webcast I did when I launched the second edition of my book a couple of years ago. And she and William Randolph were both my guests. Now, William has been a senior official in contracting with the Navy. And then he went on to the civilian side and ran billions of dollars in acquisition for, I think it was Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And then... At the, about the 13 minute mark, Eileen says, hey, William, will you drop, do, do a role play with me, sister? And suddenly spontaneously, they drop into a role play of what's a first conversation with a contracting officer going to be like, go there and listen. Mm -hmm. So the first 13 minutes, Eileen does the setup. And then you can see how easy it can be. You can see what she asks and what she doesn't. All right. You're there to learn you have some strategic questions. You're not in a hurry. You're not even there to pitch. You're there to establish that you're there to learn, that you're not going away anytime soon, that you're not quite ready yet, but you'd like, you've got done some research. You'd like to get a little bit of direction so you can build some relationships with maybe some of the people you've researched or maybe some others. And we're coming up on um, it. Well, there's never a bad time, but especially as you're coming, as you come into the beginning of the federal fiscal year, which is October 1st. The first two weeks of October, get your research done, line your calls up. Uh, when you get to the middle of October, then a lot of the time the spending has slowed down a bit. And that's actually good for you because it means that people are a little more relaxed, maybe their funds haven't been released yet, it means they have time to talk. Because in the last quarter of the fiscal year, the people who are really winning the work are ones who started conversations nine or 10 months earlier. Mm. Long conversation. So take your time and go listen to that role play conversation and write to me, let me know what you think of it. Because that's going to give you a really good idea of not only what to say, but how easy that conversation can really be. Perfect. So I just added that in there along with the link, uh, your LinkedIn, the link to your LinkedIn and your website. So that way people can come in and definitely give you some feedback in terms of how it's transformed their idea in terms of how to go after or reach out to different contracting officers and things. Um, the next question that we have is what has been one of the most effective marketing strategies for businesses who can't seem to find their space, basically, or opportunities for their industry? Um, the first is to, again, start, stop asking, what can I bid? And start looking, make a couple of choices into who's my buyer, especially um, if you're going to make calls in person. The, the pandemic really um, shifted the game and makes Zoom calls or, uh, or it was Zoom calls a 
especially also phone calls, much more common. So even if you're not in the same geographic territory anymore, some um, federal buyers know that it's become much more reasonable to expect somebody to offer a Zoom call to get to know folks. Mm -hmm. And so when you're going to, the, the key is to apply the players and layers methodology by thinking about the roles of each person and their goals, roles and goals. And here's why. You wanna give the person that you're calling the experience that every single time you call, it's gonna be a win for them. That you understand what's important for somebody in that job or in that role and that every single conversation or email or voicemail you leave is talking about something that's important to them. The contracting officer, I will tell you, is not losing any sleep over, did we award enough contracts to small business? No. Small business, and the small business specialist actually isn't either. And this is because even if, and sometimes federal agencies or specific offices don't quite get to all their goals, so long as their files are filled with good faith efforts, like your business card and your capability statement, they can show they tried. So hi, I'm a small business is not actually solving anybody's problem. Of all the five layers though, Hi, I'm a qualified small business with experience and it represents a low risk choice. Um, can you help me set up a call or a meeting or a capability briefing? The small business specialist is going to get check marks in their file for helping you do that. None of the other layers are. And so that's the right question to ask to the right person. So something you want, you want to get in front of people, aligns with the goal of the small business specialist who wants to give you credit for helping you get in front of somebody follow so far? Absolutely. Okay. And so as an exercise, I want you to think about the players at all five layers. Okay. So make a little chart for yourself. Okay. Make five columns. Okay. One for contracting, one for small business specialist, one for industry, one for end user, one for stakeholder. And I want you to think about what's the big goal, the big top of their performance appraisal, they're going to get promoted or not promoted if they don't do that thing. What is the big goal that's driving and motivating? That's the daily wake up at three in the morning. Am I going to make it focus of the person in that job? I'm asking you this because when you're thinking about what can I say, what can I bring? What can I ask? with the federal human I'm trying to get in touch with. Mm. I want you in your mind's eye to suddenly kind of boil them down to thinking about them as a six-year-old child standing on the front porch of your home as you come back from the trip. And as you get closer and closer to the door, you see this growing thought balloon coming out of their head and all they're thinking, no matter how politely you've encourage them to be, you're coming back from the long trip. And the only thing they want to know is mommy, what did you bring me? Okay. But, but also think of them as a small child. Think of them as a vulnerable person with hopes and fears and desires and wanting to be cared for and wanting to be successful and wanting to thrive. So always think about the essential small person, the, 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 the essential, the essence of that person that, uh, that they were born with. And that's always there. Taking care of that person is also what you want to do. You want to keep them safe. Yeah. And all of the things, the way they respond to you on a given day, whether they're excited or they're gruff, or they don't want to call you back, or they seem distracted, just remember, if you can, to think about that person with empathy. We can't possibly know what's going on with them unless we get to know them. And maybe they won't tell us for a while. Think generously of every single one of your federal humans, even and especially when they respond to you in ways that you're going, what? And when they don't respond to you, and this is hard. This is cool. What have you ever had this experience that people don't return your calls? Has that ever happened to you? Of course, all of the course. time. 
<laughs> all the time. So what's the first person you think, first thing you think when somebody that is a prospective customer doesn't return your call? What do you know for sure that's true? What, what's the first thing that occurs to you? They're busy for sure. They're busy. Okay. And our brains are wired to get excited, give us a dopamine hit when we get a solution, even if it's completely wrong. This is how the tabloids stay in business. Okay. Our brains make stuff up, are hungry for answers, even wrong things. And so, I mean, and so I had this conversation with somebody who ran a national company, a call, a team of call agents. And I went through this dialogue with her. She said, what's the one thing that's true every single time somebody doesn't return the call? She said, oh, they're rude. I went, wow, that's so interesting. You run a national call team. And the idea that you have, and you're training these agents is that people who don't return the calls are all rude. Wow. Because here's, here's the answer. The only thing you can know, and this is true hundred percent of the time when someone doesn't return your call, the one thing you can know for sure is that they didn't return your call. That's it. Yeah, We're dude. still <laughs> dealing with the effects of pandemic. We don't know if they are dealing with a dying parent, a, a, a child in crisis, a lost pet, being called on travel, being hauled into the secretary's office, whatever it is, we can't know till we talk to them. Sometimes they're busy or they don't need what we do or they don't need what we do right now, but we're not going to know unless we keep showing up cheerfully and another voicemail and another voicemail and another email, but we're not giving up until we contact them. They say, please go away or I'm not your person or let me put you over to Donna because Donna is really the person you need to talk to next. Yeah, that's a good uh, segue into it because it, I just recently got to the point when I first got started in the space, it wasn't immediately that they're busy. It's we talk bad about people in government, uh, how they don't work uh, sometimes early on. So, you know, they don't want to do public service. It's in the name. <laughs> it's in their name. They are public servants. They are serving us as taxpayers. They will return a call. But if we leave the message, say, say, hi, it's Joe. It's Friday. Would you please return my call? I've called you three times this week and I need this information for the proposal for the weekend. Goodbye. And I, I remember asking Dottie Romo, who was at the time working as a contract in contract support for Department of Justice. Now she's a senior official in Department of Treasury. I said, Dottie, why don't contracting officers return our call? She said, number one reason, mean voicemails. Mean voicemails. Wow. Dottie, who would, who would leave a mean voicemail? I said, like this. And she gave me that example. Went, Ooh, Cause Hey, we're human too. So mm. when you're feeling down and stressed and I got to make those six calls before I leave the office, cause I promise and I'm in a really crummy mood. Don't make those calls. Ooh. Be, put the smile on your face. They will hear in your voice, show up chipper, but get to know the players at all the layers, including when you bid and you're not successful. Ooh. One of my, one of my clients, Neil Wilson, one of my favorite clients, they're all clients. Navy Navy veteran in Florida. And he was really frustrated. He said, I've been, I spent $65,000 my whole year. I went to Florida and Alabama and Georgia and Louisiana. And they all said, oh, we love service disabled veterans. We have to award 3% of our, we've got nothing. I said, all right, Neil, take a step back. Let's see what's really going on here. I said, all right, you are mile wide and an inch deep and none of these people care you're alive. Let's sort out who's in your neighborhood. Take all the cards from all these other places that are way far away, put them in a pile. Do your business cards ever mumble to you in the middle of the night? Mind you, and just pat them on the head and say, I will get back to you. Put them in. Take the other ones and call them because close to you, you've got uh, Jacksonville Naval Air Station mm-hmm. and you've got Bay Pines Veterans Administration Hospital and mm-hmm. you've got um, Kennedy Space Flight Center. Those are your places. You're going to get to know the people better that you've met there. He found an opportunity at VA and he bid and he lost. Uh I said, well, Neil, did you get a debrief? He said, a what? I said, a debriefing. I said, oh, no. And he came back and said, wow, they said, we'd never heard of you before, but we really liked your bid. There are a couple of things that weren't quite right. So these are the things you should pay attention to next time. There's a job coming up that we really would like you to bid. Why don't you bid that one? And he won that one. So, but he wouldn't have done that if he was just plastering bids all over the place and didn't get the debriefing. Mm. So uh, an 8A, lots of people who get an 8A 
think, oh, the phone's going to ring. It's going to be great. Not yeah. so much. I mean, Hamlet Lopez, one of my other clients, was four years into his 8 day program. He bought all the big databases and he was really struggling. He was sitting just a little, un, little over $3 million in federal wins. Once he put these principles to work, he nearly quadrupled his wins within a year and hit the $11 million mark. And two years later, had landed over $60 million in federal wins. That's how powerful this is. Jackie Ferrari at American Fashion Network had never done federal business before. She did these four steps with me and within four months of finishing the program, won her first federal contract ever with the United States Marine Corps, a prime contract for $46.8 million. Hmm. Your great. mileage may vary, but she did the work. And that's mm -hmm. what I want to say. You do the work you can be successful. I like that. Your mileage may vary. Very good quote to end this on. Judy, is there any way uh, for business owners to reach out to you or connect with you? And how can they learn more about doing business with, um, with you? Make your first stop my website at growfedbiz.com. Under the resources section, you'll find on-demand webinars. They are really meaty. And with every one of those, I give stuff away, including guides and links. My blog also has powerful topics. Almost all of them also close with links to more guides and tools. On my website, you'll find under resources, a section on players and layers methodology. And if you're really looking for 10 proven tactics that have won over $65 million in federal contracts, our on-demand program building blocks of a winning proposal. It's four hours of on-demand and it is fabulous and it's ready and waiting for you there. Connect with me on LinkedIn. You can apply for a federal business breakthrough conversation. Qualified companies in just 30 minutes, I promise you, you will come away with at least three ideas you can use right now. And you can discover whether or not we might be a fit to work together to help you find the on-ramp to the faster track to the wins you deserve in the federal arena. And what, were, what was the link to the qualifying one? Uh, federal business breakthrough is, um, you'll find if you, uh, if you enter a federal business breakthrough or just the word breakthrough in the search on the website, you should get a link, you can apply. I do a limited number of these each month for qualified companies. Even if you don't qualify for a breakthrough call, you'll still get a link to resources that can give you some next steps. And of course you can pick up my book on Amazon. Thousands yeah. of people have found it really super useful and procurement technical assistance centers and counselors and trainers across the country are also using it right now. I'm going to go ahead and grab this YouTube link. This is the last link I'm dropping in the chat. Listen, if, go ahead and drop a comment and just let us know how you enjoyed this episode as well as any questions you may have. This has been awesome. Judy, thank, thank you. you so much for stopping in. And you. I, as you were going, people were liking and commenting at the same time. So I'd love to know what people's takeaway is. If there's a, a particular thing you found valuable, please let us know. Because when you share that aha or that takeaway, that helps other people also go, oh, yeah, that thing. So help each other. L please drop into the chat your yes. aha or your takeaway. What did you find valuable? What did you learn? And what are you going to do because of what you learned today? All right. The chat is open. Go ahead. Keep on dropping them in there. Oh, what's Cheyenne said? Great information. <laughs> she said it's all great information. So let's see, break it down a little bit more. Let us know sure. what, what was that moment where you said, oh, I need to do that. I'll definitely say what mine was. What's yours? For, uh, the follow-up aspect of it so the you noted that if you're not following up with those existing business owners or uh buyers that you're doing business with how can you leverage that to go to the next stage and i realized that i don't do that enough i don't go back and ask for i need to do more of that too it's not yeah. just you so i okay. there's it's always on my list too remember i said i want to learn from somebody who's stumbled and fallen flat and goes oh crap there's other stuff i haven't done that would be me I have about three major sales fails every week. 
I, this morning I got distracted with having to reschedule three medical appointments and I managed to blow right past a 9am call that somebody, I paid somebody money to put on my calendar and I had to kind of say, I'm so sorry. I leave three messages and two voicemails and two emails. Is it, can we please rebook? Being human is what we all are. You can probably the person that I messed up on is probably messed up before. And I have to kind of go, please forgive me. Mm-hmm. And if, like they say, if you're not failing, you're not trying. So <laughs> just saying, um, but no, definitely. Thank you so much, Judy. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll definitely be reaching back out and all of these links. Listen, everyone, make sure you share, you like, you comment, and you go ahead and check out the uh, Judy's website, the resources on there top tier okay definitely top tier uh someone said that they're just about to start an llc so they love this content uh, so they're just procurement technical assistance centers if you are new you're just starting your company your llc you're just trying to figure out whether and how federal business is for you it's a long road if you're new to federal always check out the free resources at your procurement technical right. assistance free. center in which definitely judy has a lot of those on there and also check out our youtube channel we do these episodes every single Thursday at 1.30. Mm. Uh, this season, <laughs> this season is season three. We've been focusing heavily on uh, state and local opportunities, but had to throw some federal uh, contract work in there. Last season, we had, you know, Department of Homeland Security. So we had a few different agencies on here. So and, make sure you and go back. State and your experience at state and local can definitely open the door. Doing business with any <laughs> government, any set of federal or state or local or county humans is not easy. If you are doing business with a, a, a federal or state, or so with a state or local or county or regional government now, I want you to think about which federal agencies have responsibilities most similar, have problems most similar to the ones you're solving for your state and local clients now that could give you the clues. And a lot of the time, people at different levels, government talk to each other. So they would, they might be great at helping you meet the, their federal counterparts. So ask those questions. Listen, the big ask, always ask, always ask, always ask. Uh, but yes, all right. I'll see y'all in the next episode. Someone said, now the, the comments start to roll in as we get out of here. Uh, but we'll see you all in the next episode. Thank you again, Judy. And I will talk to you shortly. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.